Hey, thank you. Thanks for showing up. Sorry about the people standing. Uh, my, my favorite part about the NSA story and all the NSA documents are the code names. I think code names are pretty cool. I think we don't have enough code names in our life, and we should really think about where we can use code names. I'll give you a few of them. Uh, muscular. Uh, muscular is NSA's program to collect Google and Yahoo user data by eavesdropping on the trunk lines between their data centers. Uh, this was done probably with the help of Level 3 Communications. Level 3 was their provider for those trunk links. Uh, Level 3's code name uh, is, is uh, Little. I think as a general rule that if your data supplier has an NSA code name, you're probably screwed from day one. Uh, this is different from NSA's program to collect Google and Yahoo user data by eavesdropping on the links between the individual users and the web servers. Uh, this has many code names depending on which service provider you're using, which, which, uh, where the tap point is. And we see a lot of them, Fairview, Blarney, Stormbrew, Oakstar. A lot of them we don't know who they're referring to. Uh, those two are different from PRISM, which is NSA's program to collect Google and Yahoo user data by asking the companies directly. Uh, another interesting program uh, code name is Quantum. Quantum is NSA's program to do real-time packet injection from the network. So all those tap points used to be passive. Uh, now they are uh, more active. This runs on something called Turmoil. And there are sub-programs here. Quantum Insert inserts packets. Quantum Cookie is, does something that forces users to divulge cookies to de-anonymize de people. Uh, there's something else called Quantum Hand. We don't know what that is. It's a bunch of sub-quantum programs. Uh, another, I think, really cool code name is Fox Acid. Fo Fox Acid is what's known as an, what the NSA calls an exploit orchestrator. Uh, just think of Metasploit with a budget. <laughs> and, and this is a server that sits on the net that you are tricked to visiting, possibly through a, through a quantum insert. And, and exploits are served to you. Uh, code names are, include Validator, United Rake, uh, the probably worst code name ever, Egotistical Giraffe. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I think at the NSA lunchroom, the Egotistical Giraffe people sit in the corner while the Fox Acid people get the main table. <laughs> uh, once you, uh, the uh, part of Fox Acid that determines which exploit you get is called Ferret Cannon. I'm actually not making these up. Although there are several sites on the web that do make these up, which is kind of neat. Uh, other implants you can get, uh, Blackheart, Mineralize, Highlands, Vagrant. Uh, one I actually talked about on my blog uh, yesterday was called Somber Nave. And its, its coolness is that it jumps air gaps. It sits on computers, not on the internet, turns the wireless on or you're not paying attention, sends stuff over it, and then turns it off again. Uh, lots of code names for surveillance tools. Uh, Evil Olive is the IP location database that kind of monitors where everyone on the planet is if they have a cell phone. Uh, lots of other analysis tools. Uh, we see Marina, we see Pinwhale, Mainway, X Keyscore, a bunch of others. An important code name is Bull Run. Bull Run is the NSA's program to deliberately subvert the security of products protocols, standards that we all use. Uh, there's a lot. I mean, no one's done a code name database yet, but we've seen hundreds. Uh, the main takeaway is that the NSA has turned the internet into a giant surveillance platform. And this surveillance platform is robust. It is robust politically, legally, and technically. Right? I started by listing three different ways the NSA has at getting at Google and Yahoo user data using three different alliances with the companies, three different technical means of access, and three different legal authorities. And that kind of robustness is not an exception. Right? The same is going to be true for cell phone data, for internet data, and everything else. Right? What we're seeing in public is that the NSA continues to lie about its capabilities. And a lot of this is hiding behind tortured inter interpretations of words like collect, or incidentally, or target, or directed. Uh, we see a lot of 
the same program cloaked in multiple code names sort of hide what they're doing. And whenever someone testifies that the NSA is not, it's, something is not being done under this program or under this authority, I can guarantee you it is done under some other program or some other authority. Right? That is a, there's a lot of sharing between organizations, and this really hasn't come out very much. You know, we're seeing the NSA documents, but a lot of this is shared with the CIA, FBI, NRO, DEA, other Five Eyes countries. Right, five Eyes is uh, US, UK, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, kind of the rich English language speaking countries club. You know, we're seeing some of that. We're seeing uh, NSA sharing data with DEA and telling to lie about it. The term is called parallel construction. Uh, we're seeing some of the NSA devices for, uh, for faking cell phone towers and, and grabbing a cell phone data. Very similar to Stingray, which is the FBI's program, probably the same technology. And fundamentally, the NSA's mission is to collect everything. And you see those sorts of slogans permeating the documents. Collect it all, know it all, exploit it all. I mean, these are what the agency is trying to do. And, and you see it in sort of the far-flung reaches of the programs. Program is to collect uh, internet data from airplanes. Right? Program is to collect uh, the chat conversations in virtual world. Right? I mean, the, that's where you sort of see the mentality at its most extreme, right? that there can't be little pockets of uncollected communication. And, and to understand that, you really have to understand the NSA's history, you know, where that mentality comes from. Right? The NSA was born during the Cold War, where a, a sort of a voyeuristic interest in the Soviet Union was normal. I mean, that's what we did. And we collected a lot of data. Right? Some of it useful, a lot of it not. A lot of that depended on whether it's tactical versus strategic. It's really a lot easier to learn the capabilities of the new Soviet tank than it is to predict the fall of communism. Right? One's a lot more tactical. And this sort of ubiquitous collection mentality really should have died with the Cold War. But it got a new lease on life after September 11th. Because that's when the intelligence agencies got an impossible mission. Never again. Right? Make sure this never happens again. And if you think about it, if you're given the goal of making sure something never happens, the only way you can possibly achieve that is to know everything that does happen. And when the enemy changed from the Soviet Union over there to the terrorists in this room, the giant eye, which was looking over there, now has to look everywhere. And that looking everywhere has been, been aided by, by technology, right? by, by the natural trends of IT. And fundamentally, data is a byproduct of the information society. Everything we do on a computer creates a transaction record. And so data becomes a byproduct of all the internet age socialization we do. Because everything we do is increasingly mediated by computers. And this data is increasingly stored, stored and increasingly searchable. And this is just Moore's law. Right? Data storage drops to free, data processing drops to free, and it becomes easier to save everything than to figure out what to save. And the result is we're all leaving digital footprints everywhere in our life. Right? Cloud computing exacerbates this, and it has a lot of sort of natural properties that come out. Wholesale surveillance, right? follow everybody. It would have been impossible before. Surveillance backwards in time. Follow that guy last month. Right? The, the, the death of ephemeral conversation. Systems that never forget. Right? I mean, something I think is going to change our society enormously, we haven't really grappled with. Right? And none of this is a result on mal of malice on anybody's part. Right? This is just the way computers work. So the result is a public-private surveillance partnership. 
Right? There's a fundamental alliance of business and corporate interests. And we have built systems that spy on people in exchange for services. Right? Surveillance is the business model of the internet. And a lot of NSA surveillance piggybacks on corporate surveillance. Whether it's getting internet cookies, whether it's using your cell phone as a tracking device, either directly uh, because you have a GPS, or through the cell tower, or through apps that transmit location. Uh, the code name for that one is called Happy Foot. I tell you, code names are cool. Right? And everything else. This is a combination of overt collection and covert collection, which is also came from the Cold War. I mean, it was pretty often we would go to US companies and say, hey, you know, you're getting trunk communications from the Warsaw Pact. We, we want to access to them. We also had a tap undersea cables in the Soviet Union because we couldn't ask them. Nowadays, overt collection is complex. Right? We, we see cooperation. Hey, AT&T, can you drop on everything? Sure, put your stuff in that closet over there. Don't tell anybody. We see bribery. We see threats. We see compulsion. Right? This is truly the golden age of surveillance. Because everything we do is now surveillable. Right? And it's not only metadata. And I think this is one of the the biggest PR losses we got when the president said it's only metadata. Actually, he, say, he says, and he said it twice, don't worry, nobody's listening in your phone calls. I hate the fact that he's using the word listening twice. He didn't use recording, transcribing, analyzing, reading. <laughs> I don't know, but it kind of bothers me. He likes to use the word listening. Metadata equals surveillance. It's sort of an easy thought experiment. Imagine you'd hire a private detective to eavesdrop on somebody. That detective would put a bug in his, I don't know, his car, his home, his office, and you'd get a report of the conversations he had. If you asked that same detective to put someone under surveillance, you'd get a different report. Where he went, who he spoke to, what he read, what he purchased, what he looked at. Right? That's all metadata. Fundamentally, metadata equals surveillance data. And in a lot of ways, metadata is much more important than conversation content. You learn a lot more about what's going on from the surveillance data than from the eavesdropping data. And something that hasn't been talked about much are the, are the analysis tools. The NSA has some really sophisticated analysis tools for going through this data. Uh, the good example of this was the uh, Washington Post article on the cell phone location database. And they had a few examples. So the NSA looks at this database, which is a database of, sort of everybody's movements around the world. And they look for pairs of people coming, to, coming near each other, turning their phones off, and then turning their phones on again an hour later going away from each other. Right? They look for secret meetings. They know the phone numbers of... US agents overseas, and they look for phones that are roughly tracking their location. They look for people have, who have tails on them. Uh, they look for, for anonymous phones uh, that get turned on, used for a while, turned off, and another phone is turned on in the same place and used for a while. They look for burner phones. Right? And that's just one database. You know, last week, uh, we saw a research project from the, a, the Canadian NSA, from someone with the job title of Tradecraft Developer, which we should all aspire to. <laughs> and he's looking at, at IP data of people's logins and geolocation data of IP addresses and trying to tell uh, if an airport looks like a hotel or an office, try to tell the difference of what the IP address was, and then if he can find people who don't want to be found based on who's logging in where. Kind of in interesting, interesting report. Uh, it turns out Microsoft did much the same research and, and patented it. I'm not sure how, where this all stands now. But there's a lot of this. And, and unfortunately, the public debate tends to focus on particular collection. 
right, the Verizon cell phone calling record database. But it's never that, right? It's Verizon metadata plus contact list collection plus various sub data mining techniques. Or it's uh, drones with cameras plus face recognition plus Facebook's tagged photo database and NSA's location tracking of, of phones. Right? You, you start looking, putting these things together, and you see some very sophisticated analysis. And I hope there'll be more stories about that. Right? Another thing, this is actually not just about the NSA, or really just even about the US. Right? The US has a very priv privileged position on the internet, but this is really about general techniques. Right, we get this extraordinary window into the NSA's activities from the Snowden documents, but none of this is something any well-funded nation-state adversary would not do. Right, the, the techniques in quantum are pretty much how China runs the Great Firewall. Right, Russia, Syria, Iran use a lot of these techniques. Right, and remember, technology spreads. Today's NSA programs become tomorrow's PhD theses and the next day's hacker tools. Right, so when we see the, a lot of these NSA programs, what we're seeing is a, a three to five year window on what the criminals are going to do. And in a lot of ways, that fundamentally is the harm. Right, we have built an insecure internet for everyone. Right, we've basically enabled the panopticon. Right? And all the losses of freedom and liberty and individuality that come with that. You know, we now have a complete loss of trust in technology and in protocols, in the institutions that govern the internet, a lot of the corporations that provide cloud services or infrastructure equipment. Now, unfortunately, there are a lot of details we don't know. These documents are NSA only. I don't think there's anything on US Cyber Command. And they are SIGINT only. I've seen nothing on ComSec. And company names are very, very rare. Now, that prism slide of the list of company names, we were all excited because we see company names. It's like the only one. A lot of these company names are hidden behind code names. And these code names are classified ECI, extremely compartmented information. Near as I can tell, that means they're not written down. So in a lot of cases, we're just not going to know who's compromised, how they're compromised. We're just going to know that a lot of things are compromised. Now, in, in some ways, this is, might be better. Because if we knew the names, we'd have just chased yesterday's problems rather than working on tomorrow's solutions. And really, we have a choice. We can build an internet that is vulnerable to all attackers, or an internet that is secure for all users. Right? Basically, we have made surveillance too cheap. So, so the solution is to make it expensive again. Now, there's, there's some good news, bad news here. In his first interview uh, after he became public, Edward Snowden talked about it. And he talked, he said, he talked about encryption. And he said, encryption works. Properly implemented strong crypto systems are one of the one thing, or what, are one of the few things that you can rely on. And this is an important lesson. Cryptography works. Right? This is the lesson of NSA's attempt to break Tor. And the NSA can't break Tor, and it pisses them off. Uh, this is the lesson of the NSA's program to collect uh, uh, contact lists from the backbone. Uh, if you looked at their uh, collection data, they collected about 10 times the amount of data from Yahoo than they did from Google, which seems odd because Google is made about 10 times as large as Yahoo. But at the time, uh, Google used SSL by default, and Yahoo did not. So it was a much more fruitful avenue of attack. Right, this is the lesson of muscular. There's a great handwritten back of the napkin diagram in the muscular presentation, which points to the point where the SSL has been removed so the data can be grabbed. Cryptography works. The math works. Uh, unfortunately, 
the next sentence in Snowden's reply to a question is sort of equally important. Unfortunately, endpoint security is so terrifically weak that the NSA can frequently find ways around it. Right, the math works, but math has no agency. It's the stuff around the math that is the most vulnerable. Now, we do know there exists some piece of cryptanalysis that the NSA has, at least some piece. Right, we, we know this. We can guess this because they make a huge investment in mathematics. Right, they basically hire the top 10% of the country's mathematicians every year. Presumably, they're doing something. And, and in a, a document called The Black Budget, which was also released, I think, in August, uh, there was an introduction by the Director of National Intelligence, James Clapper. And there was one sentence in it. And the sentence kind of just lives there out of context, so I'll give it to you. I think the words are important. We are investing in groundbreaking cryptanalytic capabilities to defeat adversarial cryptography and exploit internet traffic. So that quote doesn't sound like we've hired a bunch of really smart math guys and are hoping they get lucky. Right? That quote sounds like we've got something. It's on the edge of engineering practicality, and we're working to build uh, the massive supercomputer, the big memory array, the huge interconnection project, the, the thing we need. Now, we don't know what that is. I have uh, four guesses. I had three, but someone suggested a fourth. Uh, the first is elliptic curves. Like, there's a lot of math in elliptic curves, and it's, it's reasonable to assume that there exists some pretty good cryptanalytic techniques inside the NSA that aren't outside, that either uh, exploit elliptic curves in general or some unknown to us class of elliptic curves. We do know that the NSA has attempted to influence curve selection. Right, so that points to that. The second is some general advances in factoring. Right, and if you look at the academic world, factoring gets cheaper. Factor a 10 here, factor a 2 there, factor a 5 there. You assume the NSA is 10 years ahead of the state of the art. You can plot the curve and see where they are. Right? Perfectly plausible. Uh, third possibility is RC4. RC4 is a stream cipher invented by Ron Rivest a long time ago. And it is just on the edge of breakability. And it's a beautifully designed cipher that, that we just can't break but feel like we should be able to. And I can go into lots of reasons why. Plausible that they have something. It's very commonly used. Uh, the last is some uh, technique to exploit bad random, bad random number generators. There's a lot of bad random number generators out there. You can exploit one, you can do very well. And that's the sort of thing, right? You'd want some large engineering project to build the computing system, the, the hardware parallel system to do that. Right? But we still we know that most cryptography gives the NSA trouble, at least at scale. Right? Most of how the NSA breaks crypto is by getting around it. Bad implementations, default or weak keys, sabotaging standards, deliberately inserting backdoors in products, or uh, as it's known, exfiltrating keys. Exfiltrating equals stealing. But we do know that if there is a key they want, Right, some default VPN key that's being used by this circuit they want to listen to, they'll go in and get it. Right, still, mostly the NSA relies on unencrypted stream streams of traffic. Right, internet data that's not encrypted, cloud services that aren't encrypted, cell phone data, cell phone metadata, other third party data. Right, so here's the problem again. We've made it too easy to do bulk collection. But what we want is, is TAU, the Targeted Access Operations Unit. Right? That's what we want. What we don't want is bull run. So the solutions here are, are varied. They're, they're complicated. And I think that's necessarily so. Right? The problem is complicated. And it's going to include Government self-corrections, technical countermeasures, legal countermeasures, 
international cooperation, and I think a major shift in how we think about security and privacy globally. All right, so I'll talk about those one at a time. So self-corrections inside the NSA. Right? Amazingly as it may seem, the NSA had no contingency plans for all of their secrets being leaked. <laughs> right? It took them, what, six weeks to get a PR firm with the proper clearance to get the messages out? I mean, they, they fixed that, but it really is surprising. And the political cost-benefit analysis has changed. Right? The political blowback from the NSA surveillance abroad has been enormous. And this will limit what the NSA does, right? politically. There's a fundamental changing nature of secrecy going on. I think there's a major generation gap here. Right? It used to be when you joined an intelligence agency, you were picked from college, you entered the club, you were there for life. It was kind of like the movies. You take, they took care of you, you took care of them. Right? That kind of quid pro quo doesn't exist in a world of contractors. Right? Snowden didn't work for the NSA. He worked for a contractor. He had no job security. Right? Chelsea Manning was on a four-year tour. And these people are looking at this relationship very differently than a career NSA analyst. Right? And the NSA is going to have to incorporate the risk of exposure into what they're doing. Right? They have to assume that everything they do will become public in three to five years. Right? And that's important, because if Snowden told us that the NSA was spying on North Korea and the Taliban, nobody would care. So we were spying on Belgium, or I guess that the UK was spying on Belgium, which is like Connecticut spying on Nebraska. <laughs> right? This risk analysis changes. And I think there are going to be self-corrections inside government. You know, this effectiveness of bulk collection is being challenged. The last two NSA directors, General Alexander and his before him, General Hyden, were both believed in collect everything. But there is a contrary belief that this isn't effective, and that there are fundamental limitations of intelligence, that this collect everything mentality might not be the smartest. There are self-corrections going on inside corporations. Right? It used to be cooperating with the NSA was cost free. Because the NSA assured you nobody would ever know. And now, nobody believes that. So we're seeing a lot more fighting back. The public opinion is very much against companies that are cooperating, especially overseas. We've seen lots of public announcements of loss of sales. Cisco, IBM, the Cloud Security Alliance, AT&T, have all talked about losses of sales because of this. Right, they're now lobbying for more openness because they need the world to trust them with their data. Right, so reputation matters here a lot, which means you're going to get a lot less cooperation. Now, we know Yahoo fought a court case, and, and we're, we're, we're happy for that. So did LinkedIn. There are a lot of technical things to be done. I mean, fundamentally, the NSA might have a larger budget than every other intelligence agency in the world combined, but they are not made of magic. Right? So our goal should be to leverage the economics, the physics, the math, make eavesdropping more expensive. Right? We're never going to eliminate targeted collection. I mean, we don't know enough to build computers that are secure from a targeted attack. But we can build protocols that are secure against bulk collection. Some of this is redesigning protocols. Right? Ubiquitous encryption on the internet would solve a lot of this. So encrypting the backbone becomes important. Right? Provides real security against bulk attacks. Provides cover traffic for those who need it to stay alive. 
more encryption in the cloud, right, better forward secrecy. We kind of know what to do here. We just have to do it. I mean, redesigning some of our products and services to build security in. Right, usable security is hard. I mean, the lesson of 20 years of PGP, one-click encryption is that one click is too much. <laughs> but we have counteracting lessons from something like OTR. A you know, really easy to use, powerful chat encryption program. Or uh, full disk encryption. Very easy to use, no latency, you don't even notice it. All right, so more endpoint security, more cloud encryption, especially on phones. Better anonymity tools, better integrated anonymity tools. More open standards, more open source. Right, this, is, this stuff is harder to subvert. Not impossible, but harder. Target dispersal. I think we were way more secure when there were 100,000 ISPs than when there were 100, simply because there are more targets. And the la my last one is my hardest, is assurance. Right, we need the ability to test whether a program does what we think it does and nothing else. Anything along the laws, those lines would be incredibly valuable. Right, there's a lot we can do technically, but largely I think this is a political problem. And it's a difficult political problem. We are now past the point where simple legal interventions can help. And if you look at some of the things the president is proposing, they focus on particular collection programs, particular authorities. It's, it's too late for that. Right, the systems are way too robust. But we sort of know what the political solution kind of looks like. Right, transparency, oversight, accountability. This is fundamentally how we secure ourselves when we have to give institutions power over us. Right, the problem is that laws have lagged technology. I have a quote from, from General Hyden. He gave this quote after he was in charge of the NSA, but it's a, it's a really good one. And he's talking about capabilities and that the NSA follows the law. And this is what he says. He says, give me the box you will allow me to operate in. I'm going to play to the very edges of that box, which is something you'd probably expect an agency to do. Tell me the rules, and I'll follow them to the absolute limit. And the problem here is that technology constantly makes the box bigger. So the laws you know, now don't cover all that new area. And the NSA rushes to fill it because they're way faster than the laws. So the best, the best we can do is make laws that are technologically invariant. You know, and we can think of some of them, right? laws preventing bulk collection of innocent Americans, right? laws prohibiting the NSA from deliberately weakening security products and services. Again, the problem here is robustness. But of course, even if we do succeed here, reigning in the NSA only affects the United States. It's probably impossible right now that we're going to get any laws passed that protect non-US persons. Certainly, anything we do doesn't affect the actions of other countries, right, either friendly or not. And you hear this argument occasionally. If you reign in the NSA, then China will do it, and China will win. And that's fundamentally an arms race argument. Right, there's a zero-sum game here. It's us versus them. If it's not us, it'll be them. That is a fundamentally flawed frame, and we will never solve this as long as we're in that frame. We actually need to get governments to realize that a secure internet is in everyone's best interest. That it doesn't matter what China does. We need to secure the internet. Because what that does is it turns a zero-sum game into a positive-sum game. You have laws and treaties to support that. You have technology to support the laws. You have laws and technology to deal with non-compliant actors, state actors, non-state actors. It doesn't solve the problem. Right? It turns it into any one of those other really hard problems. 
like money laundering or nuclear nonproliferation or human trafficking or small arms trafficking. But at least in those, we all know where we're headed. Right? We might not be able to solve the problem, but we kind of know where the solution is. We know what the solution space looks like. We're not even up to that point with surveillance. But we can do this. The NSA has a dual mission. And it, it was from the Cold War. Protect our communications, attack their communications. Worked really well when ours and theirs were different. Works less well when ours and theirs are the same. When we both use Microsoft Windows and TCP IP and PDF files, right, and Dell hardware. Right, that dual mission was very unbalanced after 9-11, and it needs to be rebalanced. Right? I mean, again, the surveillance here is robust. It's politically robust, it's legally robust, it's technically robust. And we need to solve this not just for the NSA, but for everybody. Other governments, cyber criminals, rogue actors, Right? We have to believe that a secure internet is vital to our society. But in the near term, I don't think we're going to win the stop doing us argument. I think the best we can do right now is the tell us what you're doing argument. But eventually, I do think we're going to win the protecting is more important than eavesdropping. Right? That just because everyone else is building a Maginot Line, we shouldn't do it too. And if you think about it, this problem is bigger than surveillance. This is fundamentally a problem about data, about data sharing, about surveillance as a business model, about the societal benefits of big data versus the individual risks of personal data. And we have a lot of those issues. Right? Behavioral data for advertising. Uh, health data. I think this is the cleanest formulation. If we took the medical data of everybody in the country and put it in a large database, the research benefits would be enormous. Yet it's incredibly personal. How do we do that? Right? So, I mean, that's the same thing we see uh, with Google Maps. Right? If you let Google surveil you, or everybody, they will give you better traffic data. And you can get home faster. Yet, hey, they're surveilling everybody. It's, this problem comes up again and again. How do we design systems that benefit society as a whole while at the same time protecting people individually? So I think this issue is the fundamental issue of the information society. This is the one that we will struggle with solving for decades. This is the one that our grandchildren will look back at us at how bad we were at solving it. And this is the one that's important. And we have to start. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm happy to take questions. There's a microphone there. There's a microphone there. And if people will stand behind them and not hold up their hand like that, I will call on them one after the other, and we will have 10 minutes of fine questions. Yes, Alex Burnin, MIT. I have a bit of a technical question for you. Part of what was leaked in the documents, um, I noticed, was that BlackBerry had given the NSA difficulty when they started encrypting their traffic. And Skype was also difficult for the NSA to break. They were able to break the voice communications, but not the text, the uh, video communications. Uh, I noticed also that you regenerated your PGP key after you'd first seen the documents to be 4,096-bit RSA as well as a 4,096-bit RSA subkey. But you kept the standard default um, <clears throat> excuse me, algorithms in the PGP key set. So my question is, given that it suggests that there's some kind of differential attack against symmetric key cryptography, this partial known plain text, text uh, statistically based, do you really trust 3DES and AES in your PGP key? I trust AES and very much. I, so I don't believe there are those cryptanalytic attacks. I think primarily what's going on are, are defaults, 
uh, not having access to the keys, bad implementations, that it's not the math. That the math does fundamentally work. And I think this is a big issue, because there's a lot of futility out there. There's a lot of, you know, we can't do anything, so why bother? And I think we have to fight that. That there's a lot we can do. Right? Fundamentally, I think PGP works. I mean, I, I moved it to the highest defaults because why not? Right? I, mean, I mean, I don't care about the latency when I'm encrypting email. So th those, it's prudent to do that. But I do not believe they're, they're breaking triple DES and breaking AES on the fly. I, Thank you. I just don't think the math, I don't think the math supports that. Please. Hi there. Um, my name is Peter Iannucci. I'm also from MIT. I have a question about national security letters. So uh, there's been all this discussion about whether uh, corporations are permitted to report on the number of NSLs they received and the number that they complied with. My question is this. Is there any reason why we should believe that corporations are being served with NSLs and not simply their employees behind their managers' backs? If I'm running an, informa an information company, if I'm running an internet company, how can I even trust my employees not to hand over my you know, certs to the NSA under NSL? So that's true. So uh, I'm less worried about NSLs. I think they are sent through the front door. But I actually believe NSLs are just legal cover for the NSA. They got the data already somewhere else, and they want that process to make it more legal. Uh, I would worry much more about individual engineers cooperating. That if someone comes to you as a, a patriotic employee of, of some company and says, hey, look, this is going on. Obviously, you want to help. Do you mind you know, just turning on this maintenance port and looking the other way? And you do it, and you, nobody knows. I'm much more worried about collusion at low levels than I am with legal compulsion at low levels. I think once you're doing legal compulsion, it goes to the legal office. And that's my guess. But I, I, that is a worry. I worry about it with the, with the more informal ways of cooperating. You know, uh, why don't you just uh, you know, put this mask on the IV and don't tell anybody, or, or, or leak it over here and don't tell anybody. Right? That, that's, very, that's much easier to do without anybody's approval. Is there any reason to be concerned that um, like a piecemeal effort to secure some piece of data will actually draw more attention to that data? You know, like if I encrypt only one email to like one particular person, then is that worse than simply sending it in clear text? So it's better or worse, right? We do know that the NSA does flag and save encrypted data because it's just not much of it. So you might as well save it all because you might find it useful someday, right? You might get the key somehow. So yes, using encryption does flag you, which is why I think the solution is not to not use it. The solution is for everyone to use it. Right? For you to use encryption, you provide cover for those who need it. And that's a good thing. But we do know that using encryption is a flag. Yes. Okay. Hi, my name is Lena Casey. I'm from uh, Harvard Law School. Um, we similarly have discussions about the NSA and what to do about it, but they're completely devoid of any technical knowledge about what's actually going on. And I'm curious if you think that there should be a push among lawyers and policymakers who are interested in this um, discussion to inform themselves a bit, or if we should just work on the transparency oversight general qualitative solutions and let MIT people think about the other side. <laughs> You know, I think the more techies and policy people talk to each other, the better tech and better policy we get. And, and, and this makes it hard. I mean, understanding these issues is difficult. They're very technical. And I don't think we can craft policy without it. Understanding how these systems work, how robust they are, I think is critical. And, and, and you know, in general, we get better tech policy if policy people understand tech. I mean, it, it just works out that way. Um, Chuck Connell, I work at Nuance Communications. Um, when you talked about the big four things you think the NSA might have up its sleeve, I was surprised you didn't mention quantum computing. Do you think they're any closer to building one than universities are? No. I, I, with quantum computing, I mean, the, the, the media went to town over this, but I think it's largely the media going to town. No. I mean, I, I, I mean of course the NSA has a research uh, arm doing this. I mean, why wouldn't they? They have research on in everything. But no, I, I don't think quantum computing is anything to worry about in, in our lifetimes. I mean, eventually, sure. But uh, it, nowhere near near term. I don't think they're any closer. No. Uh, you guys were standing in line before he got there. Fair enough. 
Hi, I'm Alex Matthews. I'm the national chair of the Restore the Fourth Coalition. Um, what do you think that as part of the short-term legal efforts to constrain the USA, it would be useful for Congress to pass the USA Freedom Act, the main NSA reform bill? So I think the Freedom Act does some useful things. I think it, in the general scheme of things, is largely irrelevant. Uh, my fear is uh, Congress passes it, pats themselves on the back, and goes home. But it is something, and I think it is, it is worth doing. It's certainly worth doing for the statement that there are excesses. It, it's, so yes, I, mean, I am in favor of it, but kind of reluctantly. And then I'll go there. Okay. Peter Train, formerly of RSA. Um, I'm curious. Uh, Restraining, we've heard a lot about what the NSA is doing um, from the Snowden leaks and so on and so forth. But the fact is, every intelligence service in the world is what does this or wants to do this or is yes. trying to do this. Um, I find myself wondering if uh, legal constraints are really the appropriate thing to spend our efforts on rather than trying to work on technical solutions that make it so they couldn't gather the data to start with rather than restraining them from doing so. I mean, I think we have to do both. I mean, if we just did technical, if we just approach this technically, we run the very real risk that the NSA sends whatever technical company a secret letter saying, don't implement that correctly. And we're stuck at some deep hardware level. Right? Hey, Intel, you know, break your random number generator in this way that we just described. That's impossible to, to find out. I really think both have to work together. That you need tech because, yes, there always will be bad actors, but you need policy because policy can always subvert tech. And nothing will be perfect, but I'm trying to build a resilient system that is hard to subvert from either direction. Well, that's good, because at the moment, I feel like I'm in a very septic environment, computing-wise. It's pretty bad out there. Right. Please. Hi, uh, I have a question about an article I read uh, about a year ago in uh, Wired before the uh, Snowden uh, revelations. I seem to recall the article talking about the Bluffdale facilities in Utah, and some, there was some speculation that, uh, going back to what you talked about earlier about uh, possible uh, cryptanalytic breakthroughs, that there may be some something going on, on at Oak Ridge, um, and how they may be harnessing Bluffdale to do something like, say, break AES. And I was wondering if you had anything to say about that. So we don't know about the facilities. I mean, lots of people have been, been calculating how big they are I mean, capacity based on uh, square footage, based on power requirements, I mean, sort of indirectly trying to uh, figure out what they are. My guess is, is they're giant storage and analysis facilities, that they're less breaking things and more analyzing the massive trove of unencrypted data that goes through their doors every millisecond. And that's what they're for. We don't know. And there certainly could be parts of that that are doing some advanced crypt analysis. We're really just speculating. Hi, Dave Clark. Uh, you've made the distinction between surveillance and eavesdropping, which I think is a very important distinction. And you're talking a lot about encrypting data, which actually gets at the issue of eavesdropping, this gigantic mass of uh, unencrypted data. But I agree with your point that the surveillance or traffic analysis in one framework is a incredibly revealing thing. And as I think about the architecture of the internet and the architecture of the underlying layers, the cell system, the cellular system, and so forth, it's really hard to understand how to bring crypto to bear, to bury some of the basic facts like where I am and so forth. So when you begin to think about redesigning networks to reduce the the revelations associated with metadata. Um, do you have some theories about the right way to go at that, or how we can uh, how we can bring basic tools like crypto to bear to, to solve that? Because end-to-end encryption is, yeah, I understand that, but then there's all this gluck underneath. And, and that's an interesting problem. And, and I think it's less crypto and more designing protocols to be more peer-to-peer. -peer. I mean, we sort of learned this with file sharing. You could have you know, a centralized file sharing system, or you can have a peer-to-peer -peer system that is more resilient to attack. I, I mean, some stuff I think you can never get away from. That my cell phone has to know where I am, otherwise it can't give me phone calls. Right? But is there some way to design that so that the whole network doesn't know that? Maybe it's just known locally. Uh, some of the, the metadata is, could be encrypted. 
the, uh, the data that's sent up from uh, my phone apps, which we know the NSA is grabbing, location data and other things. That kind of stuff can be encrypted. So in a lot of cases, I think we can encrypt metadata because it's not needed in the network. Some stuff we can't. And I'm hoping that with some smart redesign, we can minimize or anonymize the metadata we can't encrypt. Could I just have a quick follow-up? Yes. The disadvantage of peer-to-peer -peer is that it reveals that I'm talking to you. A countervailing argument could be that if we have a secure server in the center of the net, and we somehow believe that that's resistant to attack, then I talk to the server, you talk to the server, all the NSA knows is everybody talks to the server. So it's not clear to me that peer-to-peer -peer actually sure. reduces the, 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 the traffic analysis or right. And doing that properly is fundamentally the way Tor works. Right? There are lots of servers, and so I, I think there's just, I don't have answers here, but my guess is there's smart redesign we can do. So I'm taking a uh, last question, and that's over there. So just a couple quick ones. Uh, just broadly, do you think Snowden is a traitor and like sort of on the whole? So I, <laughs> I, I, really, I really dislike the question because I mean, fundamentally we're in the middle of it. And I think that question will be for history to decide. Okay. That, that knowing that in the middle, when we don't know the outcomes of everything. What are the outcomes of this public debate? Uh, what are the outcomes of these, uh, these NSA excesses? Uh, are, or will they be determined to be illegal or not? You know, will history decide they're illegal? Uh, what he did was, was, very, was, was very individually moral. And he fundamentally betrayed the NSA because he, had a, he felt he had a greater allegiance to the nation as a whole. And that's a very powerful argument. And, and, and I, I mean, right now, I agree with it. But I don't think you could answer that question for another dozen years. OK. And it, it, it's, it, it, you know, it's an important one in the media. <laughs> but I'm much more interested in the documents than the, the moral history of how they came in front of me. OK, and then just one sort of follow-up. Given that, I mean, everyone here is clearly very interested in this topic and passionate about security, it's a limited part of the lives for the general public. Do you have a message that you, know, you would recommend we take to our friends and colleagues on why we should care and why we should go towards encryption and do something that probably people have never even heard of to make the internet better for everyone else? And this is a hard question. And I think uh, if we fail, it'll be right there that the counter argument, the counter argument's easy, right? Terrorists will kill your children. <laughs> That's the argument. And the thing about that argument is, is it stops all rational conversation. I mean, I can discuss the inefficacy of bulk collection. I could discuss the expense, both in money, in liberties, in, in our legal system, in our economic system. Right? I can talk about the abuses and the harms. I can talk about the loss of privacy. But those are all pretty theoretical against terrorists will kill your children. Now, I really think that it's going to take some years before the craziness of 9-11 further subsides that we can look at this rationally. Uh, the the counterargument to fear is indomitability. Right, that we are stronger than this, that we are better than this, that we don't have to stoop to this kind of stuff. Right, that we can respect our laws, our country, our liberties, our ideals, and still beat the bad guys. That we don't have to subvert everything that, that, we, that we hold in order to beat them. These still are hard arguments. I mean, if I had the, the good argument, I'd be making it left and right and center. So anyone in communications, start working on this. <laughs> Thank you Thank very you. much.